But when we start talking about things such as ancient predictions, you can take that off, John. Generally, we go back to the Bible. The Bible is a book that so many people walk around with as a holy book. They kiss the book, and they put the book on grandma's piano, or they <laughs> carry it with them in to the sanctuary, and all of this stuff, it is a holy book, but it's not. The, the Bible is not a holy book. The Bible has nothing to do with things holy. The Bible is a scientific book, a book of astronomy, astrology, and a book of the human mind. Now, the Bible, which is even mislabeled, laid the groundwork thousands of years ago for people to understand themselves and their environment of the earth and their environment in the cosmos. In other words, you have to come to grips with what you are, who you are, what your purpose is, and then what about the environment you find yourself living in on the planet earth? And then what about the environment that you find the planet earth in in, in this spectacular but mysterious cosmos that we, we hang like a ball in the middle of all this, you know, uh, wild, violent, electromagnetic upheavals that go on constantly. But unfortunately, instead of knowing and understanding the book as a scientific document on body, mind, and environment, we allowed a bunch of superstitious, ignorant people from the Dark Ages to present it as some kind of religious holy book for one purpose, for one purpose, to control people, to take people's money, and to put people on guilt trips. That's what it's used for. That's the only thing the Bible is used for, to control people, Look, it says here, you better not do that. To take people's money. If you want to not go to hell like it says in the Bible, you better give me 10% of your income. And to put people on guilt trips. That's what it's used for. And yet the book has nothing to do with that. The book is quite simply a mythological book that approaches life from the inner as a scientific expose of life in this wild, creative, explosive universe. Now, if we want to grow up and look at, the bi at this book called the Bible and examine it as a scientific document, then you're going to find the answers to the basic questions that involve you. You're living, you're dying, you're experiencing the earth and the universe. Because what you'll be able to do, you'll be able to take what's written in it and compare it with what science has discovered and shows us today. But what is your alternative to that? Your alternative to that is to light candles, sing songs, and wait for the man in the sky to send his son back to earth riding on a white horse like the Lone Ranger. That's the alternative. Now, mo most people, most people prefer to light candles, sing songs, and wait for the man to come on the white horse like the Lone Ranger. That's, what they, that's, that's really as far as they want to get involved in this. And, and, and then when you, you look at life and how it has developed and enveloped uh, all of us and evolved, you say, well, you can see what the result is. The words in the book called the Bible were written in symbols and mythology so that people evolved, when people evolved into rational beings with developed brains, they'll be able to see what happened, what was happening now, and what was going to happen. And then these people would be able to equip themselves mentally to handle the vibrational changes that would come along. Now, the Bible, as a scientific document, couldn't come out thousands of years ago and start talking about cosmic changes because what could, nobody could see anything. It couldn't come out and talk about 
uh, photons and protons and, 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 and all kinds of uh, electrons and atoms and so forth because nobody knew anything about it. But you see, it, it talked about them in symbolic terms. And then when the people of the earth had evolved to the point of having a mind that could start to understand this, they could open the book and not only understand what was being said, but realize that whoever wrote this was of a higher intelligence, a, a higher intellectual being. So that's why the Bible, as a book, was written in a hidden language, because at the beginning of the evolutionary period of the brain, it was impossible to understand things concerning quantum physics and atoms and electrons and so forth. But now we should be able to. But you have to, you know, the common sense. You see, the people that were writing the Bible up in some far off 45, 55 uh, cosmic entity somewhere were sitting down and writing this stuff, and they got a lady sitting there with a snake talking to her, and uh, the other guy saying, maybe you better not put that there because they're really going to believe there's a real snake talking to this lady. And the other guy says, oh, it's ridiculous. The fact that there's a snake talking to her will let them know that it's symbolic. Uh-uh. <laughs> no. -ho. Because you can go to any of the churches that line the breadth and breadth of the highways and go in and talk about the snake talk, and it's the truth. It's not only a snake, there was a guy named Balaam that got on top of a donkey. <laughs> and he hit the donkey, get up, and the donkey turned around and said, what the hell are you hitting me for? <laughs> well, I believe every word of it, they say. I believe every word of it. There's axes floating, people flying up to the moon, walking on water, virgins having births all over the place. And it's all written that way so that you, being an advanced intellectual race, would know that's nonsense, so it must mean something else. No. They believe every word of it. And so they have never, the, the human race is supposed to get from here to here, and if you take the position they've gotten with the Bible, they're still here. They haven't moved an inch. The snake still talks, the jackass talks, the axe floats, and, you know, and all the virgins are having babies, and you know, it's all terrific. So, strange stories, like I was just talking about, were interpreted literally by people. But along the way, some people became aware and were able to finally understand, hey, this stuff is not literal. I mean, no, snakes do not talk. We all know from watching the elections that bushes don't talk. <laughs> that was a good one. That was. That, I just thought of that, too. I just thought of that. Let me say that again. We all, no, I want to. But when one understands, he or she not only realize what has been, in other words, once you get the code here and you start to understand this, you not only understand what happened thousands of years ago, you know, but you understand what's going on now. And you understand what's coming down the pike, what's going to happen. And then the most important thing is, you understand that this book was written by a very advanced race from a higher dimension who were able to discuss cosmic things and subatomic things and celestial things with great knowledge thousands and thousands of years ago. So having said that, we have arrived here at the time of awareness. And unfortunately, the great majority of people continue to flock into churches and look at the ancient stories as literal holy stories instead of stories of science and the subatomic told in magnificent symbols. They don't know anything of that. So we pick up the, the scientific book, the book of science, mislabeled the Bible. We open it to the book of Revelation, and we see what was predicted by scientists then and how it lines up with what is predicted by scientists 
Now, we just saw a prediction, didn't you? I mean, if what they wrote here, it was in the Bible, this would have been a great prophecy by the holy men. No, but this was a prophecy. This is a prophecy by the scientists at NASA's Hubble Space Center. More holy than the holy men. Now, we covered the opening of the first four seals in the book of Revelation. And what did we determine? We determined that they were, cause, uh, they were discussing the change of the human mind in the guise of the four horsemen of the apocalypse, signifying the physical, pale horse, the emotional, red horse, intellectual, black horse, and spiritual or invisible white horse. But moving on to the fifth, now stay with me here, moving on to the fifth, sixth, and seventh seal, other things come into play which have a direct relationship with that which has most recently occurred in the cosmos. And you're sitting here saying, what has most recently occurred in the cosmos and I'm about to tell you. Now in particular, what we're saying, what I'm saying, is that the seventh seal explosion would be connected with supernova 1987A and NASA has told us that that thing is going to light and you're going to be able to see it. In other words, the light is going to touch the earth in 2005, this year. So you don't even have to wait or have faith, you know, and all that nonsense. It's going to happen. But before that, there is the opening of the sixth seal, isn't there? I mean, this is the seventh seal. What happens when there was the sixth seal open? So it doesn't limit light explosions to this coming to Earth. So let's, look at, let's look at that um, overhead here. Revelation 6.12, And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, there was a great earthquake. The sun became black as sackcloth of hair. The moon became as blood, and the stars of heaven fell unto the earth. Even as a fig tree casts her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. In other words, you know, you see a tree and it's got the fruit on it, and the wind starts to blow and the stuff starts to fall on the ground. So it's in the same way the stars fell to the earth. Now what you've got to look at is verse 13. That's the one I want to concentrate now, okay? And the stars of heaven fell to the earth. You understand that? Okay. Initially, you would think of a catastrophic event, wouldn't you? I mean, holy cow, the stars are going to come down and fall on the earth. Well, let me tell you right now, if one star fell and hit the earth, that's the end of that ball game. We wouldn't be around to see the second one, all right? <laughs> all right. So we have the stars crashing to the earth. Now, let me tell you here. Let, let us look at the prophecy of the sixth seal in light. And let us look at it and compare it with what just has happened in the sky. This just happened. Let's go on to the next one. Hubble Space Telescope, the <laughs> brightest galactic flash ever detected hits Earth by Robert Roy Britt, senior science writer for the Hubble Space Telescope, posted February the 18th, 2005. What does it say? The brightest galactic flash ever detected has hit the Earth. And people said I didn't know what I was talking about. <laughs> Let me tell you something. This had an effect on the upper level of the Earth's atmosphere. Do you really think that something like this could have an effect on the Earth and not have an effect on that little thing you have sitting on top of your shoulders? Well, <laughs> don't be frightened by this now. What we're going to read will knock out the source of this flash as being supernova 1987 In other words, what people are writing me saying, is this what you're talking about? Is this what you're talking about? Is this supernova 1987A? Is this the seventh, the flash of the seventh seal? Is this, is this it? 
Well, what we're going to look at is going to show us, no, it's not. But what I'm going to say to you, what about the sixth seal? And if it is the sixth seal, wouldn't that be just as significant? Because remember, NASA told us the seventh seal is going to go off this year. OK? They didn't tell us the sixth was going to go off this year because they didn't, excuse me, obviously didn't know it. So this looks like it is right smack on the mark. Let's look here what it says. A huge explosion halfway across the galaxy packed so much power it briefly altered Earth's upper atmosphere in December, astronomers said Friday. It altered Earth's upper atmosphere. How in God's name could it alter Earth's upper atmosphere and not alter this upper atmosphere? No known eruption beyond our solar system has ever appeared as bright upon arrival. Well, you couldn't have seen it unless you can top the x-ray vision of Superman. In gamma rays, the event equaled the brightness of the full moon's reflected visible light. The blast originated about 50,000 light years away and was detected December 27th. <laughs> Now, here's something interesting about this. This one you couldn't see. NASA says the seventh, you will see. Let's see. Don't you wish somebody else knew about this? Just 20 people in this room in Forked River. It's terrific. Now, let's look at the comments from the scientists. And th before you do this, Joan, these comments are really neat. These are science. Watch this. OK. Scientists are surprised that a magnetar so far away could alter the ionosphere. I love this line, that it can reach out and tap us on the shoulder like this. Reminds us that we really are linked to the cosmos, said Phil Wilkinson of IPS Australia, the country's space weather service, that it reached out and tapped us on the shoulder. That's, whew, what a line. And he said the fact that it did tap us on the shoulder reminds us that we are really linked. Whoa, would that be something if this uh, sixth angel reaches out and taps us on the shoulder and says, whoa, here's Johnny. <laughs> this is a once in a lifetime event, said Rob Fender of Southampton University in the UK. We have observed an object only 20 kilometers across, 12 miles across, on the other side of our galaxy. Now get this one, folks. Releasing more energy in a tenth of a second than the sun emits in 100,000 years. Is that something? You see what's coming? You know, if, if people would wake up and, and they would know that, you know, this, these are cosmic events and that they, we were told of these events in the book of Revelation, they would stop singing, this is the day that the Lord, and they would get serious with this stuff and, and, and really start to look and say, what, do I, what should I do to start to get into harmony with this? It can reach out and tap us on the shoulder, reminding us we are linked to the cosmos. And you know what that, when, when it says that, you know what this guy is saying in so many words? We are really linked to God, whatever that is. An object only 12 miles across. What's that about, the length of Long Beach Isle or something like that? No, no, not that much. Energy in the tenth of a second more than the sun emits in 100,000 years. And I would say when you see something like that, I would encourage you folks, get your meditation going. <laughs> Somebody is tapping you on the shoulder. And I didn't say somebody was tapping you on the shoulder. And no priest or minister or rabbi or pope or anybody told you that because they don't know. 
Phil Wilkinson of IPS Australia's Country Space Weather Service said, somebody's tapping us on the shoulder. Now let's look at that verse in Revelation again that we looked at before in light of this. When he had opened the sixth seal, it was a great earthquake, the sun became black as sackcloth, and the moon became as blood, and the stars of heaven fell unto the earth. Let's repeat that. The stars of heaven fell unto the earth. Now let's look at the next one, and, and let's see what this was. The stars of heaven fell into the earth. Researchers don't know exactly why the burst was so incredible. The star, named SGR 1806-20, spins once on its axis every seven and a half seconds and is surrounded by a magnetic field more powerful than any other object in the universe. The next biggest flare ever seen from any soft gamma repeater was peanuts compared to this incredible December 27th event. Now, what I wanted just to show you here, that when the Bible said, and the stars fell to earth, here is a star that fell to earth. In the context of reading mythologically, a scientific uh, treats this, this is a star that fell to earth. The light touched the earth. We were tapped on the shoulder by this star. So now you have to ask yourself, we know what the seventh is, supernova 1987a, and we know that that's going to happen in 2005, so we have to ask ourselves, could this be the sixth seal? Boy, it would be right on time, wouldn't it? Wouldn't it be right on time? waiting for the seventh to go and light up the earth in 2005 and the sixth seal just in advance of it? Does, is anybody going to pay attention to this? And now, does this set the stage for the explosion of supernova 1987A, the seventh seal, because the sixth seal it seems like it has gone up. Isn't it curious to you that NASA says, well, in 2005, supernova 1987A is going to blow with such a light that we'll see it on Earth, and just before that, because it hasn't happened yet, this thing happens, which is the most massive, greatest light explosion ever seen in the history of the universe by a light that is, what? 100,000 times, whatever they said, more than the sun or whatever, more, more energy in a tenth of a second than the sun puts out in 100,000 years? Can you imagine such a thing? You can't even imagine such a thing like that. I mean, what, shouldn't that get our attention? You see the difference then if you look at the Bible as a scientific book in Revelation and you, and you see this as opposed to all the craziness that we've been taught. I was reading also, as I was studying this, about what the, this is called a magna tar. A magna tar. That's what does this kind of stuff. And you see the word magnetic in there. Uh, but it, uh, there's only about 10 or 11 of these that they know. Maybe there's 12. Probably is 12. <laughs> I would say there's probably 12, but they say there's only about 10 or 11 of them. But you know, there was an interesting statement there <laughs> that I read about, and you can imagine just what nature would have to do to throw the whole economic system into chaos. I mean, the whole economic system of the whole world into absolute chaos, which is predicted in that book. Let me show you how easy it is to do this. If a magnetar flew past Earth within 100,000 miles, the intense magnetic field would destroy the data on every credit card on the planet. <laughs> Woo! Just like that. So much for that. Um, this isn't going through. You can't have the ping pong table. I had to put this in, you know, I thought that the... Uh, <laughs> so, you, you can see, you know, if these angels or whatever they are up there, these light beings, uh, you think it's time to shoot one by within 100,000? Yeah, all right. Yeah, I have a tank full of gas, fella. 
yeah, I'll pay with the credit card. No, you won't, no more. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, it could happen. It could happen. Now, this explosion was massive. But it was so far that even as massive as it was, I mean, te a blast in, in 10 seconds being more light than the sun in 100,000 years, even though it altered the upper atmosphere of the Earth, it, it couldn't be seen from the Earth. Supernova 1987A, according to the scientists, will be seen. You'll be able to, you'll be able to go out in the daytime and see it. And so you'll be able to sit back and relax and watch the show. You want to, you can, that's it. But as you're watching, you should ask yourself, if this explosion of light, and I know I asked this question a minute ago, but just think about this. If this explosion changed the upper levels of Earth's atmosphere, would it not be reasonable to assume that it could also change the upper levels of the human being atmosphere? Could it possibly change the Earth and not change the living things that run around the Earth? Of course not. Now let's look and see if we can make some common sense out of the opening of the sixth seal and the seventh seal in the book of Revelation. Understanding that this is referring in human terms to the electrical energy that flows up the spine to the brain and kicks over to the right hemisphere of the brain, okay? And that this happens as a result of meditation. In the East, they call it kundalini. It's electrical energy in a serpentine motion that flows up the spine, hits the brain, and kicks to the right hemisphere of the brain. Now, where we see this portrayed in the Bible is in the book of Revelation, in Revelation uh, 5, verse 1, and uh, right here. And I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within on the back side, sealed with seven seals. The references to the right hand indicate the right hemisphere of the brain. The throne is the higher human part of human consciousness. The book is the book of life that's written within, that DNA and all of that stuff, spirit, whatever you want to call it. Within is within the human body. Your backside is the spine, and the seven seals are what the people of the East call the seven chakras. So it's in the Bible. It's biblical. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals? And no man in heaven nor on the earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book nor to look therein. This is a problem to many, many, many people. And that's why these two paragraphs here you should take very carefully and very seriously. People try every different way to activate this thing called Kundalini or the seven seals. All kinds of ways to try to have out-of-body experiences. They go to Sedona, Arizona. They want to sit on top of a vortex and listen to Indians playing guitar, whatever the heck. But the truth is, this experience cannot be activated by any human being. It is non-human. Oh, sure, you can stick your finger in an electric circuit, you know, and have all this stuff go through you. But, I mean, you know, that's not what this is supposed to be. It is electromagnetism from above and can only be activated through meditation in which the person totally yields him or herself up into nothingness and allows the higher light to intervene. This is being very, very specific that only that which is above, the light which descends from above, like this magnetar, only that has the ability to open the seal, to swing open that gate of heaven inside of you. There is a door inside of you, which is a gate to the Garden of Eden, which is a gate to the temple, which is a gate to heaven, which is a gate to God, which is locked. And it takes, and it's just like if you go to the shop right or store, there's an electric impulse, a seeing eye, that 
causes that door to open. The same way inside of you, there's an electric impulse that causes that door to open. The same way inside of you, an electrical impulse causes the right angular gyrus of the brain to open to have an out-of-body experience. I'm not talking about that based on what I think. I'm talking about that based on scientific proof that came from Switzerland. So, you can't do it. But it will happen if you yield yourself up to it. It will happen. Now, the scripture is an answer to how to do this. Basically, you don't. It does it by itself. So let's go on and look at uh, the next one, five, four. And I wept much because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look at it. And one of the elders said, Weep not, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals. So that which is, again repeated, that which is within you and must be opened, I mean that gate inside of you has to be opened <coughs> to reconnect you to what we call God and can only be opened by that electrical impulse from above. We don't have the code down here to do it. No prayers, no doctrines, no religion, no priests, no ministers, no popes, no rabbis. Nobody's capable of doing this. It's inside of you, and it opens by that which enters into you from above. And then the talk of, don't worry, the line of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the book. Now, if you look at that, the line of the tribe of Judah, the root of David. Here are two references that we have to bring together because what we're going to do is we're going to take that lion of Judah, okay, the root of David, and we're going to connect them together to the seventh angel, okay? So we have the seventh angel, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, and the book. All symbology, all something that means something else. Now, we, what we, when we lift out of all of this, out of the Bible, and we move to a more persuasive realm of science. I mean, this is not a persuasive realm of science when we look into the book of Revelation and it's talking about the Lion of Judah and all this kind of business. We're looking for the seventh angel that can provide for us. Let me go back again. We are looking for the seventh angel that can provide for us the Lion of Judah and the Root of David and that book inside of us that must be open. Now before we, before we move on and, and go into that, let me explain to you the Lion of the tribe of Judah. The tribe of Judah is very much a scientific symbol, okay? According to the biblical myth, in the, dis in the desert, they assembled in the north, in the south, in the east, and in the west, okay? In the north was the tribe of Benjamin. In the west was the tribe of Ephraim. In the south was the tribe of Reuben. And in the east, at the point of the rising sun, was the tribe of Judah. Now, the tribe of Judah was at the point of the rising sun. The lion is a symbol of the domicile of the sun, the constellation Leo. So the lion of Judah would be the light that touches those who assemble at the right side in the east. The lion of Judah is those who are in meditation and assemble at the east or the right side by separating from the thoughts of the left side, okay, are touched by the light which is the Lion of Judah. The Lion of Judah is Leo, the sun, the light from the right side. Now how can we show the tribe of Judah is a scientific symbol? 
I mean, you know, it's a Bible thing. In the book of Numbers, we find that the tribe of Judah is positioned in the desert at the east at the point of the rising sun. We just covered that. Let's look. Numbers 2, 9, and all that were numbered in the camp of Judah were 100,000. 100,000. Okay. And four score. Four score, a score is 20,000, and four score would be 80,000. Okay, 180,000 and 6,000, 180,000 and 6,000 and 400, 186,000 and 400 miles per second is the constant speed of light. 186,400 is the constant speed of light, which means that Judah is a scientific principle. And the Lion of Judah is the light that courses through the universe on an angle because as it passes heavenly bodies of planets and constellations, it is bent by the gravitational pull, so it is an angle of light. And when it hits the Earth, it is an angle of light. It is a photon, which is a messenger particle. It is an angle of light or a messenger particle, or as you know it, an angel of light, or a messenger of God. And so the lion of the tribe of Judah is to be found in the domicile of the sun, which is Leo, meaning that the light, uh, the lion of the tribe of Judah is light. And so that which will open the seal inside of you is the light which will descend as you are in meditation activating the pineal gland to open the door and the light receptor of the body will, 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 will caress that light which descends and enters into you. And that will put you in harmony with the cosmos and not place you in a position where you can be injured by what is about to come down. How many Christians will assert the line of the tribe of Judah is Jesus? That's true. Jesus is the Son God. Jesus is the Son of God. Mythologically, and in Greek, each letter has a numerical value, and the letters that make up the word Jesus is Greek total 888, which is the mythical. Sun. He's the sun god, the light. So the scripture is saying that the book of life within us can only be opened by the higher light symbolized by the sun. Electromagnetism. Electromagnetism, which the scientists said, and you saw it with your own eyes, have just tapped us on the shoulder, getting attention. Here I am. This is why your meditation is so, so, so important and why we have changed the whole outlook here and what we're doing here with meditation. Because only through meditation and no other way can you receive the light which will open that book for you and throw open that electrical door inside of you that will reconnect you to the higher light. Now, if you recall a little earlier in what we were doing tonight, we read a comment from one of the scientists on the most recent explosion of light. And what did he say that is consistent with this? Let's take a look. Once again, it can reach out and tap us on the shoulder. It reminds us that we really are linked to the cosmos. It reminds us that we really are linked to the cosmos. You see? I mean, people have to be reminded because they're, they're, they're so involved in religious superstition that reality is, is you know, they think it's new age or, or some bizarre thing that's going to attack them. It reminds us that we really are linked to the cosmos and the scripture is telling us that our inner person must be open to that light not only to tap you on the shoulder, but to hit you over the head as well to get your attention and say, hey, this is real, this stuff. The Lion of Judah 
is what opens the seventh seal, meaning the sun. The electromagnetic cosmic energy that descends to the earth is the only thing that will do that. Now, in addition to supernova 1987A, which we're waiting to explode in 2005, there's another cosmic event in the making that could happen at any time. In other words, it could be exploding right while you're sitting here. And that is at a Carina, the seventh angel, the catalyst of the seventh seal. And there he is, or she is, in all the glory. You can see the angelic wings of Etta Carina, the seventh seal. So Etta means seventh. The form of the angel. The light covered by this shroud of angels' wings has never been seen. Science has never seen the star behind that one. God knows what that is. If you think this other one was something, what's behind there? So we know that the Lion of Judah, which is the cosmic light, opens the seventh, but how is this connected to Edda Karina, the seventh angel? Let's look. Revelation 5, 4, and I wept much because no man was found to open the book. One of the elders said, Behold, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seventh seal. The seventh seal with the seventh angel and the Lion of Judah are connected to the root of David. What this is, as I'm offering this to you, is evidence, evidence to prove the credibility of what's being said here. To further enhance the credibility of what we're looking at. I mean, it's pretty credible when you see NASA saying 2005 for this, and then a few weeks ago we had this blow, which looks like it was the sixth seal in advance of what we're saying here is the seventh seal going to blow. And now they connect the seventh angel to the son of David. Now, what evidence is there with Etta Karina and the son of David? Professor Chris Davidson of the University of Minnesota. Davidson is the principal investigator for the Etta Karina observations by Hubble. His name is Davidson. Son of David. It could be anything. It could be Schwartz. Chris Schwartz, I don't care. It don't mean nothing. Antonio Bianchi, it don't mean nothing. His name could be Billy Bonestock, it don't mean nothing. There's 50 gillion, zillion, trillion names. It could be Sodom Hussein, it don't mean nothing. His name is only one name already for the whole thing. Eddie Karina, the seventh angel, his name is the son of David. That's good. You see, folks, that's all I need. <laughs> Doesn't make any difference what anybody says, I got what I wanted. <laughs> you can go on that, you can go on the internet. Go on the internet sometime. Type in Chris Davidson. This guy's name's all over the place. Every connection that has to be made for light descending from above to affect the great cosmic chains of the mass mind falls in place. Everything falls in place. The seventh is coming. It looks like the sixth has already arrived. You've seen it with your own eyes. But only those who are so stubborn as to cling to their tradition at their own peril deny what is happening today. I mean, then we say, what do you mean at their own peril? What do you mean peril? If they, think that if they send this thing 100,000 miles they, uh, outside, all the credit cards are going to go right in the toilet, right? It's the end of that game. Oh, that's going to be great. <laughs> Boy, does that take care of the stress. What do you mean I'm late for the payment? What payment? I don't have any contract with you. Now, the word Eta means it is the seventh letter of the Greek alphabet, initially meant seven. And this is something that is called all science to look up. 
at a carina. There's no explanation for it. Science doesn't understand it. It is a massive discovery. Could it be the seventh angel, which will activate the single eye on fire, 1987A? The Lion of Judah is the sun. It is the most massive and brightest star known in the universe at a carina, equal to 100 suns. Is this the lion? The root of David, the astrophysicist in charge of this is Chris Davidson. Is he the son of David? No, well, he's not. Is he the son of David? I'm not saying. But for this treat, he is. The seventh, the lion, the root of David. But we cannot discount the sixth angel of Revelation and power coming down to the earth described as stars falling to the earth. You can take that down, Joe. Now, is what we discuss today the activity of the sixth angel? It could be, couldn't it? And if so, wouldn't that interest in you in allowing the higher light to open your seventh seal and connect you to that great light? I would think you would want to. Now let's pick up on where we were in Revelation because we only have a few minutes to go in discussing the sixth and seventh seal. And keep in mind that we are discussing the possibility that this explosion of light reported December 27th was the sixth seal. Revelation 6.14, And the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their place. That's an ominous warning. That's a very ominous warning. The warning is when this begins to take place, and it has begun to take place, the access to the higher is closed. In other words, did you ever see these scrolls, you know, like they see in the, in the movies, Quo Vadis, they open these scrolls and then they roll them up, you know. That's what I say. It's, it's like that. The scroll is rolled together. The instructions are no longer available. And every island and mountain being moved out of its places, it just simply means there's nowhere where you can reconnect. The earth is shot. The problem is something you can already see in action in the country that you live in right now. Look, with all of this, Uranus comes along, turns everything upside down. Do you know that you live in a country, the United States of America, which never attacked anybody first? It has changed. It's now in a preemptive position of attacking another nation that they're suspicious of. They don't have any proof, but they use shock and awe. I mean, come on. The, the United States of America was always above that kind of mentality, but now it's not. And you know, this is the scary part. The people don't object. People in, in this country and in Cuba by the United States are now placed in prisons if they're suspected of being something and they're not allowed to have a lawyer and there's no time limit on how long they can be kept. In other words, they can be kept forever. Do you know that the, this country now has come up with plans where they torture another human being and it's a method that they use. It was never like this in this country. No such thing. No matter how bad it got, we never would ever do things like this. So the country has turned totally upside down from the glory that it was to the aggressor that it is, and nobody cares. When the people approve of bombing others with no reason, there's no proof of wrongdoing on the part of those people. When the people do not protest the torture of other human beings, when the people do not protest the jailing of other human beings with, in secret places with no representation, what has happened? Heaven has been closed. The role has been tightened. They've made their choice, and God is not a part of their choice. 
And the kings of the earth and the great man and the rich man and the chief captains and the mighty man and every bondman and free man hid themselves in the dens and said to the mountains, fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sits on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb. You know what, say? You know what the lamb is? The lamb is the gentlest, silent, cushiest, softest little thing that can't hurt anybody. And inside of you, when you enter in in your meditation, in the darkness and in the silence, and the music begins to play and filters through and fills your body, and it pulls you away from the thoughts of the left and lifts you up to the light of the right, you are sitting there with the lamb on your lap. That's the lamb.